The first panelist will be Dallas Martin. Dallas is president of the National Association of Financial Aid Administrators, NASFA, I believe is the acronym. He has represented the association before Congress, the executive branch, and the general public for many years. Prior to joining this organization, Dr. Martin served as director of program planning and administration for the Division of Student Assistance with the American College Testing Program. He has worked as an administrator of financial aid and student personnel services. Dr. Martin received a PhD in college student personnel administration in 1971 from the University of Northern Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to be here with you today. The topic you have chosen to address today is very important because it fundamentally affects the future of our nation, not only in terms of our current and future competitiveness in the industrialized world, but also because it addresses the physical and economic health of our nation's citizens. While the United States continues to enjoy a period of economic prosperity that has benefited many, it has not been a period that has been helpful to those who are or remain at the lower end of our economic scale. It is well documented that educational opportunity is not equal among all of our citizens, whether at the elementary, secondary, or post-secondary level. As stated by the Congressionally Appointed Advisory Committee on Student Financial Assistance, low-income students who graduate from high school academically prepared to enter college still confront significant financial barriers. And they're also less knowledgeable about the financial resources that are available to them. Clearly, the cost of higher education has risen steadily as a percentage of family income. And as a result, more low-income students must abandon their plans to attend college on a full-time basis. Instead, many of these students are working long hours, attending college part-time, and borrowing more heavily. In fact, these students, as well as many others, who have to use credit financing through student loans to help pay for college, are finding that the current federal limits on annual and cumulative borrowing amounts are unrealistic in terms of their needs. As a result, students and their families are forced to turn to more costly private or alternative loan options that are not as favorable and which are not regulated by our federal Title IV loan statutes. While the financial aid system in the United States is the most comprehensive in the world and assists some 13 million students annually, it is still incredibly complicated and confusing to many students and their families. Therefore, they turn to the people who have the primary responsibility for bringing it all together and who have the expertise necessary to guide them through the process, the financial aid administrators. Nowhere else can a student and his or her family get the complete information they need about state, federal, and institutional aid programs and procedures and the timelines necessary to navigate the process efficiently and effectively. Since the passage of the Higher Education Act of 1965, the aid programs have grown dramatically, and that growth has brought equal expansion in the role and responsibility of the financial aid administrators. Financial aid administrators, unlike many other institutional administrators, don't graduate with a degree in financial aid administration. Such degrees do not exist. Instead, they learn from colleagues that are trained by the national, regional, or state associations of financial aid administrators, the education department, and in some cases by state guarantee agencies and lenders. They are responsible for understanding and managing almost countless requirements, including all of the Title IV statutes, a federal student aid handbook of seven volumes of 763 pages of state rules and regulations that they also have to go through, donor scholarship requirements, and lender and guarantee agency loan requirements. Further, these individuals have to understand all the details with the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act requirements, citizenship and immigration rules related to eligibility, selective service requirements, IRS requirements, state residency requirements, and numerous other issues that affect the aid programs. These individuals juggle all these responsibilities in a constantly changing world of program requirements. Still, in spite of these challenges, I can assure you that the vast majority of financial aid administrators are dedicated, extremely hardworking individuals who do everything they can to provide accurate, timely information and help to families and students who without financial aid would be unable to achieve a post-secondary education. 
In closing, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you and your colleagues as you develop legislation to reauthorize the Higher Education Act. The current controversy about preferred lender lists and institutional relationships with loan providers shows a need for some additional legislative clarity on what is and what is not permissible. But we must be careful not to impose unnecessary restrictions that make it impossible for responsible cooperation to occur amongst these parties. In addition, let me note that until earlier this year, the Pell Grant maximum award has been frozen for four years and we still need to further increase it in order for that program to achieve its intended goal. Likewise, we need to increase the annual cumulative limits on Stafford loans. And let me also say that the LEAP and campus-based programs serve important financial needs to students, and yet they too are woefully underfunded. While all of these Title IV programs are complementary to each other, there are improvements that we can make to make them better. I pledge NASFA support and the support of my members to assist you, Mr. Chairman, and to assist your colleagues as you begin your critically important legislative work reauthorizing the Higher Education Act. My members know all too well how far away we are from achieving the goal of equal opportunity for low and middle income families and students. Our focus first and foremost and must always be on meeting the financial needs of our students and families. Thank you.